my name is Ani. Uh, I'm an AI project manager at B7. And today I came here to talk about why some AI projects succeed and some don't. Um, so when I come to these types of conferences and talks, what I expect from the speakers is to talk about their experience rather than talk about general theoretical stuff that can be applied to everything. So I will try my best to give as many examples from my work experience as I can. And I think this is my first time um, speaking in front of a big audience, so uh, <laughs> uh, bear with me if I have to use my notes. Um, so let's start. Uh, so these are the things that I want to talk about today. I know that most of the mm, people here in the audience are, are more uh, business team members rather than technical, so just to be on the same page. Uh, let's just briefly talk about the definition of AI and its capabilities and stereotypes around it. Uh, then we can talk about successful projects and startups that implemented AI within their softwares. Uh, then we can talk about the reasons why some AI projects fail. And then uh, I'll talk about the project management aspects of managing uh, AI projects or startups. And I will try to give examples of the tools and tricks that helped me uh, to manage the project successfully. Um, OK, so what exactly is AI? I'm pretty sure all of you here know what it means, but I wanted to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, so basically, we know that AI is a branch of a computer science that um, you know, emphasizes the development of intelligent machines that think and work like humans. So what they have similar to humans is that they can learn, they can reason, they can perceive images or videos, they can understand a language and detect some sort of sentiments and emotions. Um, so these similarities can be uh, achieved through um, very intense training of the data set, labeling it, and then deploying the AI model. Uh, but as I said, I'm not going to go into a very technical details. So the output that we get from training those models is uh, the systems that we use every day. It can be social media chatbots, it can be recommender engines, self-driving cars, voice assistants like Alexa or Siri. Uh, it can be used in the healthcare systems and in the facial recognition systems as well. Um, so, as you already know, AI can be used within multiple industries and uh, sometimes even a very basic software which performs a very basic automation can be called an AI and in reality they are not and during yesterday's talks, Irak Irveku had a uh, very nice presentation about uh, startups that use the name of AI but don't use like the actual system. So I would recommend to uh, have a look at the recordings and presentations. Um, so there's a very thin line at which distinguishes what is an AI startup and what is not, but we have a lot of stereotypes that can help us to determine what AI can not be. So these are the movies that I like very much. We have Ex Machina here, which is a very good psychological thriller that makes you question everything, including yourself, whether you're a robot or not. Uh, there is a very good animation, Mitchells versus the Machines, which is basically about a abandoned phone, which uh, becomes evil and decides to you know, like throw humans out of the planet Earth. Uh, then we have a very good movie, Her, and this guy here falls in love uh, with uh, his voice assistant. And then we have a very fam famous Terminator here. Um, so what these movies have in common is that all of them portray uh, artificial intelligence as something bad, uh, bad for humanity and something evil. Uh, and it's very hypocritical for uh, the film industry to say that when all of these movies can be seen in the Netflix, I don't know if you have a Netflix account, but if you do, you know that uh, when you sign up for Netflix, it has this My List, which is basically a playlist of the movies that you might like. Uh, so it basically gives you suggestions, and this playlist knows you better and knows your taste better than you do uh, know yourself. So it's very hypocritical for the Hollywood to be portraying AI systems in such an evil way when they're using AI systems all the time. Um, but well, as I said, this move, that's what these movies have in common, and the, that's a very bad thing because 
unless you are very, very interested in AI or you work in that field, you are more likely to go to the cinema and watch a, uh, some sort of sci-fi movie with a very catchy name and great leading artist and it results in you being disinformed and you having the wrong idea about what AI is. Um, so this is the same exact case with the Black Mirror TV series, even if I like it a lot, and surprisingly it portrays AI features somewhat similar to what they are. Um, they still portray it in a very negative way. Uh, for example, this is one of my favorite episodes from Black Mirror. Uh, I don't know if you have seen it, it's called The Entire History of You. And what happens here is that uh, there's some alternative reality where people have this sort of cameras within their eyes so they can record everything that's going on throughout like entire day and this is some sort of recognition system for for example um, securities um, at airports for example as well so they all have it well some of the people decided to remove it but most of the people have it um, and this episode much like all the other black mirror uh, episodes um, ends in a very sad way because this man finds out that uh, his wife cheated due to this functionality, uh, but anyway, this is what uh, this uh, this like specific episode is about, and it was aired in 2011. And here we have Ray-Ban stories, which are basically smart sunglasses, and except for all the other functionalities that it has, it has this. If you see this small round button, it, basically what it does is that it records everything that you see through your sunglasses. Uh, so it's basically similar to whatever was portrayed in that Black Mirror episode. Um, this was uh, produced this year in September, even if it was announced in 2020, and surprisingly it's very similar to whatever Black Mirror said in 2011. And to be honest, I don't really think this is a bad uh, thing, you know, because I'm, you can basically go out and have fun with your friends, drink a lot, blackout, and then have a recording of the video of the whole night, then you can rewatch whatever you did. Uh, as, as long as it follows all the data privacy and uh, data prote protection guidelines, so basically, for example, if you go out uh, and you're with your friends, you have to get a consent from them that you're filming. So this is not a necessarily bad thing. The only bad implication that it might have is that if it was introduced a couple of decades ago, we wouldn't have any of the Hangover Trilogy movies, which would be sad because I love the movies very much. They are amazing. So um, it's not necessarily bad, as the film industry tells us. Um, so the bottom line here is that with the movies and TV shows like this, which basically advocate against like technological advancement or in general AI, there is a spark of mistrust uh, of people towards technologies because, as I said, unless you work in the field, you're more, more likely to watch a movie and get information from there. Um, and this is a very common case in many of the developing countries for obvious reasons, because their technological advancement is uh, not at a high level, so they tend to uh, operate everything manually, so they're more or less not keen on using technologies either way. Um, and I would say this is a common example for everyone, because, for example, my mom, uh, she doesn't really know what I do, and it's very hard to explain to someone what I do when they don't have a technological background. But I tried in a very, very simple and easy way to explain. Uh, and she said, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. But she keeps telling people that I work for Elon Musk and we're making robots together, which doesn't make sense because I don't have like anything to do with robots, but well, that's her uh, ideas, you know? And once we were like watching TV and there was a robot Sophia, you know, like the bold robot girl uh, was here in Georgia and she, uh, watches it and she like tells me that you know like what if she goes crazy and kills all those people like there and she's referring to robot Sophia which is the ugliest robot I have ever seen she's bold she can barely move uh, and she can be unplugged at any time <laughs> so she is very afraid of uh, technological advancement and I understand what's the reasoning behind that and I know that she watches a lot of sci-fi movies so this is this proves my point once again um, so enough of the evil robots and theoretical capabilities of AI, and now let's talk about what AI really is uh, and how 
different startups use it to achieve uh, success. I would like to start with Pulsar AI, and before me, right on the stage, the CEO of the Pulsar AI, Dachi, was here to talk about their exit. Uh, so what I like Pulse, about Pulsar AI uh, is that their AI chatbot can understand very, very complex, complex questions, and their conversational flow is designed in a way that sometimes, when a customer is not informed that there's an actually a, a chatbot talking to them, they don't, they don't know, they, they think it's a human, they ask her out for a lunch, for dates, they bring flowers to the office when they come to pick up a car. Uh, so the thing is, its design of the conversation is so flawless that people often mistake it for a real person. Uh, what it does uh, is that it searches the database of the cars and provides the answer for the customers. Uh, and um, basically, it identifies um, the problem that the customer is facing and gives a relevant answer. Uh, also, sometimes when it cannot actually answer due to the context, um, it transforms either the call or the message uh, to someone from the sales team. And that way, sales team um, doesn't have to deal with a very big amount of information stream that they receive from the customers and it makes their job a lot easier. Um, they, due to that, they have greater engagement, they have longer follow-ups, better up sales, um, and it actually qualifies customers and sends uh, the list of like categorized customers to sales team so that the sales team knows that this is a customer that's willing to buy more, this is the customer that's not really interested, but we can like do something about it. Uh, so it's quite easy um, uh, for a sales team to identify a customer. And when I was working in sales, that was like the hardest part because I had to talk with a lot of people and I often like forgot the information or either I couldn't categorize because the information was a lot, it was around, I don't know, uh, 100 to 100 calls per day. Um, so I couldn't categorize the potential leads. Um, and now with the help of the Pulsar AI or Spinkar AI, uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, and the best thing about it is that it's the chatbot is on 24 seven, which wouldn't be the same case if the sales team was responsible for answering the questions. Or if it would, but they would work in shifts and it would be much more costly for the company. Uh, and so the chatbot also answers uh, the request immediately. And today when the market is competitive regardless of the field, being a fast provider is a huge advantage. So. Pulsar AI is a great example of how to achieve success by targeting specific market, targeting specific customers, and make not only the company's job easier, but for the customers to be able to, um, you know, purchase their uh, willing, willing items as well. Um, the second startup I would like to talk about is Faber, and even if Faber is not like initially an AI startup, they used AI in a very good way. Uh, so those of you who don't know, Faber is basically a software application for secondhand clothes. Uh, you can go there and you can like shop for everything. Uh, the initial idea of the Faber is very nice because it stands for like uh, the um, environmental protection, you know, because like because of the fast fashion, there's a lot of you know environmental damages, and purchasing secondhand clothes is always a better, good idea. So they had this application and they decided that. Uh, once the, their audience was big enough, they could introduce um, recommender engine. So we all know what recommender engine is. You like something specific um, that you might want to purchase and then in your newsfeed, the similar items appear. So it's very good because the market in the Faber, uh, the clothes that they sell is very big. So it's sometimes very hard to identify exactly what you want. And when they use this recommender system, it becomes much more easier to shop. Uh, and I'm not sure if they implemented this yet, but we were working on uh, developing this when I was working with Maxine AI, which was basically an image search. And this is a great functionality because, uh, for example, when I wanted to purchase some sort of uh, specific black dress, the search bar, when I typed black dress, uh, the results were not always like, 
exact. And now, basically, you can upload the image of that specific black dress that you want to purchase, and it gives you um, uh, the results that they have in the database, which is similar to that black dress. Um, so it's not always, uh, it's not all, all <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's not only for the company, but it's for the customers to be able to navigate through the application better. Um, and the last startup that I want to talk about is B7, which is basically my current employer. Uh, and their case is uh, a lot different than we had with Pulsar AI or Faber because they already had an AI platform. Uh, what B7 does is that you can go there you can um, create data sets, you can label those data sets, and then train your AI model. So it's basically what, uh, I don't know, a data scientist or machine learning engineer might want. Uh, but the thing is that when you have to label an image uh, for it to be trained, you have to use these polygons and draw a polygon um, around the shape that you want, and then you have to manually tag the item that it's an avocado, which you can basically uh, see in the other tools um, uh, video. Uh, so what they did is that they trained their own model, they uh, implemented this model into their platform. So what it does, it has the auto annotation functionality that as you can see, you just click and it tells you that it's an avocado. Um, this is great because it saves a lot of time. You don't actually have to like manually drop the polygons. And sometimes, uh, for example, when your hand is shaky, it can be quite tricky because you miss the polygons and it's not like perfectly annotated, which can be bad for the model. Um, so it's very easy to use. Um, and what they did is that they collected uh, a very high quality data in order to do this. So basically, uh, this platform annotates all the basic things that we can see. It can annotate a bottle, it can annotate, uh, I don't know, eyes maybe, but what it doesn't do is that it can't actually be more specific than that. So it can tell you that these are the eyes, but it can't tell you that, that these are the blue eyes. So you have to do like uh, subclassify it manually. But anyway, this, uh, this saves a lot of time for data engineers, for example, and it's a good platform because you can do everything at one place. So they have an environment to integrate uh, with everything and where, where you can store the data, classify the data, uh, distribute it for, I don't know, human labeling, for example, and utilize its automation. And it brings down the cost and time taken to have a good training data as well. Uh, so what do these companies have in common? So what was their key to success? So basically, what they did is that all of them identified a problem within their field of operation, and they developed a specific solution tailored to that. For example, recommender engines or even chatbots existed long before Faber or even Pulsar AI was introduced. Uh, but what they did is that they identified the needs of their customers and they divided the market and chose a specific target. For Pulsar AI, it was the car industry. For Faber, it was a realization that their customers might take like longer time to manually search for something that they want and it would reduce the amount of sales because as a customer, I might like just get bored of scrolling and like searching for whatever I want. Um, and for V7 uh, as well, uh, they identified uh, that people who want to train AI models, it takes a lot of time for them to manually label things, so they decided to make it easier for them and uh, introduce an auto-annotation tool. So, as I said, what they had in common is that they had the ability to identify a problem. Uh, they had a very well-defined strategy and Actually, not many like startups have an identified like defined strategy because what they do is that let's like you know like start a business and then we're gonna figure something out. But like it doesn't work in reality. Uh, and I would say that none of these startups actually started out to use AI um, uh, as their like initial problem solver, well, except V7 because it was initially an AI platform, but for Faber and for Pulsar AI, uh, what they did is they iterated their way uh, to the product that they have now, which is a uh, great approach. 
So they had specific targets, they were asking the right questions, it may be like in general, or it may be like uh, constructive feedback from the customers or the clients that they had. And all of them had the problem first approach. And problem first approach is something that usually works uh, in all of the like business cases, regardless of it's a tech startup uh, or a general startup. Uh, but let's just discuss it in a AI startup way. So basically, problem first approach is that first you define the problem, then you get the data which is relevant to that problem, then you apply machine learning systems, and then you get even more ideas and profit. So for example, uh, for the case of Faber, they defined the problem, they got the data, they got the data of, uh, I don't know, closing, then they applied their machine learning system, and then they got even more customers. Uh, same was the case with, with V7. First, they identified a problem that there was not a platform that would perform uh, all the relevant machine learning processes all together. Um, and then they gathered the data to train their models internally, and then they got the idea to have the auto annotation tool. Um, I would go back to uh, the well defined strategy part. So there was this IDC study uh, that I read recently. It was about an AI culture. And it said that only one in four AI companies that they interviewed uh, had a dedicated AI strategy or even a definition of AI. So uh, that, that's one of the main reasons why it, the startup can fail at its initial um, state. state, state. Um, so yes, only after you know the problems you need to solve, then you can ask if the answer could be found in data because sometimes you don't even need an AI model in order to build a successful startup and that can be an external burden for you in terms of cost, in terms of effort, in terms of everything I would say. Um, but back to the problem first approach, the get data part, uh, I would say that one of the Biggest challenges for many companies is data quality because it's not easy to get um, very good data for your training sets uh, because it must be excellent. Otherwise, machine learning algorithms basically cannot be trained correctly or if they are trained, um, they would have a inaccurate or wrong quality. Uh, it may be due to outdated data or there can be some duplicates uh, there can be some incorrect or missing information that will basically lead to the failure of AI projects. Uh, so therefore, the first step when you're dealing with an AI project is to clean up the data uh, and bring, bring it in a very structured and uh, categorized uh, clean system. Uh, and that's when labeling comes into place. Um, I'm gonna talk about labeling a little bit uh, later. Um, so also one of the reasons why uh, a startup in general or even an AI startup can fail is because of the employees. Uh, and when I say it's because of the employees, I don't mean like the actual employees, I mean uh, their strategy towards them. So it can either be because they don't want any junior uh, employees in their company because they think it's a huge responsibility, when in reality it's very hard, especially in this market today, to find a very good and very experienced machine learning engineer, for example, and they know their value and they know their price, and for a startup it can be uh, very costly uh, to hire this type of a talent. So they don't give a chance to junior employees uh, and they are not able to hire senior employees and they are left with no employees at all. Uh, but when they do hire, uh, then when hiring decision comes into play, which is basically about the comp company culture. So basically how you treat your talents directly affects the performance of the company. Uh, your recruiting process, your career development opportunities in general, your company culture, everything uh, affects the employees because when you are working for a startup, granted you know that you're taking a risk and the risk is that the startup may not succeed and basically you may end up jobless but you're willing to take that risk because for different reasons, maybe you, you like the company, maybe you like the project that you're working on, maybe you believe in it. 
Um, but n this is not the case for all of the employees. And you have to make sure that they have faith in whatever they do a and they don't have this feeling of uncertainty. Otherwise, they would either go to another company and have a stable job uh, or they will simply quit. Um, yeah. And then, obviously, lack of funding can be the reason why many of those projects fail because it's not easy to get a funding at a very early stages at your startup when uh, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what your end uh, solution is going to be, you don't know, you don't have your strategy defined. Um, so it's it's kind of going to affect you. Even if you have money, like even if your startup is self-funded, at some point you're going to need external investments because it's not uh, about the product itself because you have to pay the salaries to employees. You have to maintain your product. Because it can be either, uh, I don't know, AWS server costs or maintenance costs. Or, um, for example, if you're in an office, you might even need to pay for electricity. Or if you are operating at a co-working space, you might need to pay the price of the co-working space. Uh, so funding is something that's very crucial as well. Uh, and now I wanted to talk about the tools to use while managing AI projects. And these tools may be either like more theoretical that you can just apply as a strategy or can be like actual tools that for example, help me to better manage an AI project. Um, I would start with outsourcing heavy manual labor, and uh, I, I said that I would go back to like labeling. Um, so basically, uh, what I mean by outsourcing heavy manual labor is that when you are training a model for an AI, as I said before, you have to like manually label uh, all of those pictures. Uh, to be able to, you know, train the model. Uh, and that was the case uh, at one of the companies that I worked for. Uh, so there was a company that came to us that wanted to develop some sort of, like, you know, AI model, and they provided us with data sets, and we didn't have anyone in the company who would be able to label um, those images because all the software developers and all the machine learning engineers were too busy and they would not label anything, obviously. Uh, same with the upper management, and it's all, uh, it all came down to us, project managers, and somehow it was our job to label everything, and it was very hard because, first of all, we were not experienced in that field. The polygons that we drew were, I don't know, horrific, uh, out of the shape, um, also, it was very hard. We were using um, one of the platforms, it's Hasty AI, and now it has the auto annotation tool similar to V7, but at that time it didn't. So we had to draw everything, every polygon manually, and it takes a lot of time because imagine you have to, you spend around, I don't know, two minutes per image to label it, and then you have thousands of images. So we obviously didn't succeed and we couldn't label anything, and we lost the client. Um, so this is something that uh, helps a lot because there, there are companies in India specifically that operate with labeling and at a very cheap price. For example, they would charge uh, around $7 per uh, hour or they would charge like several cents per image or per video. So you can use their service in order to label everything. So you would um, minimize your time spent doing that and you could like do something else meanwhile and they would provide you with a very high quality labeled data because uh, those types of companies, um, even if uh, they operate in that field and they know how to label everything, they also have these people who operate in specific fields. For example, um, okay, it's very easy to label an avocado but it's hard to label some sort of bacteria or you know like um, some sort of organs when you don't have a medical background. And these people and these companies have these people uh, who have medical backgrounds, who have, um, I don't know, some of them work in a um, cancer treatment department, so they know exactly what each of the uh, images and bacteria means, so they do it perfectly. Uh, and you don't have to be afraid of outsourcing these types of heavy manual labor because in the long, long run it helps you a lot. Uh, the second thing I would advise for 
to an AI startup or an AI project is to have a customer success and partnership department separately. And I know that at a very early stage, uh, many of the startups have all these roles blended and combined. For example, if you are a project manager, you have to be a product manager, you have to be an assistant to CEO, you have to be, uh, I don't know, a customer success manager as well. But when you have the ability to grow and expand at some point, uh, it's very good to introduce this type of departments because um, when a lead comes in your company through a sales team, then it gets transferred to a customer success team which gathers all the relevant information about the company. They're basically the main contact point to them. They know everything about them. They know what type of people they are, what do they like, uh, what problems do they have at home, at their families, I don't know. Uh, so they know everything and then when they have all the defined requirements, then the project management comes into play and they take over the project and it's easier to manage. Uh, and the partnership department, it's important to have partnerships, uh, especially if you're a startup because it may not necessarily be like um, in terms of like materialistic help partnerships, so they, not, they may not necessarily give you money, but they may give you tools uh, or information that you don't have and you may uh, in exchange give them something that they don't have. Uh, so, for example, um, V7 is partnered with many educational um, institutions, such like MIT, and we know that for the computer science department, whenever machine learning engineers graduate, they will come to us and use our platform to annotate and label their data for their projects. Um, the next thing, as I said, is company culture, because um, today the job market is very competitive. You might have a lot of engineers and a lot of developers, uh, most of them juniors, most, most of them seniors, uh, but you also have a very broad range of competitors as well. Because when there's a one developer looking for a job, there's gonna be like 10 recruiters um, headhunting for them. So you have to have a very specific company culture uh, with the help of which your employees will be uh, happy and they will not have the need to go somewhere else. Uh, for example, uh, I used to work for the company which was maybe not that stable, um, but they had a very great company culture. I knew that our HR cared for us, they provided all this, I don't know, educational materials, they provided some sort of benefits, everything that you might need in the company. And I had offers from other companies, like actual corporations, but I knew that their company culture was not as uh, advanced as it was in the current company, so I decided to turn down the offer, uh, regardless of the fact that the salary was much higher um, for the company that offered me. Um, the next thing is thinking out of the box. And this specifically applies to project management because uh, I have seen a lot of AI project managers who are using only Scrum or only Kanban methodologies just because they have heard that it's very good for software development, which I mean it is, it's perfect, but it's not the same case for AI projects because AI projects have a lot more processes and a lot more milestones than a software uh, development processes have. So in AI projects you have all these labeling jobs which cannot be tracked with any of the uh, tools or methodologies that we have out here. Uh, so you have to develop something new, you have to develop something that works specifically for you. So you don't have to be afraid to either mix those methodologies or come up with something like very different and very new. And basically you have to experiment with those methodologies because I would assure you Scrum or Kanban or any other methodology will not work in many of the AI projects. Um, one of the things that I would like to highlight again is prioritization because uh, after you have gathered a bunch of questions regarding your product, a bunch of feedback, um, and you have, to, you have data, for example, to uh, start working, you have to start prioritizing your features and basically everything regarding your product into a list. So, it's highly important to have both machine learning experts and, for example, upper management or lower management, your key employees, to be involved in, in this process. And it will not only benefit this prioritization, but also it will benefit the company culture as well. Because when employees feel valued, when they know that their input is considered, they feel a lot more happy in the company. 
So you have to prioritize your problems um, based on the potential value that they would generate, the difficulty of the machine learning project, the urgency of solving each issue. Uh, and as a result, you will have a very nicely and clearly defined uh, roadmap for improving your product um, or even business processes with AI. Um, so basically, um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and what I mean by that is that many companies fail to um, uh, spend too much time focusing on the, model, on the model creation and lose the sight of the original problem. For example, in software development, using Agile is um, one of the um, I don't know, key solutions to eliminating that problem. And same can be applied in AI projects as well, because rather than waiting uh, months and months to deliver an end product, it is better to uh, have short iterations that rapidly produce outcomes. And after each iteration, you will receive a feedback from your customer or your clients that will uh, help you to improve your product. Um, uh, also, uh, when you have an early delivery, it's much more convenient because you can enter market at an early stage and then after that you can improve your product. So you have to um, develop a strategy of iteration and not think about what is my end goal, what will the uh, final stage of my product is going to be. Uh, because you have to understand your user's needs first and then you have to develop it accordingly. Uh, and last but not least, the tools that help me manage many of the AI projects. And I would start with Monday.com because throughout my experience, I used Jira. And Jira is very good for software development, but it is a very heavy application. Um, and even if it's good, it can be configured. You can like add the columns and workflows by yourself. It's still not good when labeling uh, comes into play because, as I mentioned, you can't really track uh, the labeling mm, processes through any of the software applications. But instead, which, what you can do is that you can use Monday.com. And with Monday, uh, what me and my coworkers did is that we basically created three dashboards and linked them uh, to each other. Um, so we had one dashboard for customers and it was linked with the actual labeling projects of these customers uh, that were linked to the clients. So we had all the information in all these three dashboards and we had HubSpot, we had Stripe and Pipedrive integrated into Monday. So whenever the sales team registered a customer, it would automatically come into our Monday dashboard uh, with its like uh, signed agreements, uh, like invoices and everything that the project management team needs. So Monday is a great software. It's, it's actually not that expensive, I would say, because if you buy a medium uh, tire uh, package, it's gonna uh, be more than enough, and they have their own forms, so you can create a, like a survey, and you can send it to a customer, and then they fill out everything. They fill out their company name, for example, they fill out their requirements for the project, they fill out their labeling annotation, basically a guideline of how to annotate their images, and you can then export it and send directly to Slack. Uh, if you have a Slack channel with your uh, outsourced labeling company, for example. Uh, and Monday has a very good automation features and it's very easy to configure because you basically type what you want to receive as an automation and it does on your behalf. For example, I have an automation that um, before like two days before the deadline, the end date of the project, it would send me an email telling me that in two days this project is gonna end. So like, what's the progress? Just check on the pro uh, project and something like that. So it's a great tool, helped me a lot. Um, another tool is Miro, which is basically um, an application to draw um, flow charts. Uh, so basically, if you have a very complex, uh, I don't know, delivery pipeline maybe, uh, you can draw it in Miro and it's free uh, and it gives you like very nice templates. Uh, and if you have a meeting with a client, for example, and they give you all this information about what uh, they're gonna do with the 
product project or product, you can use Miro and draw like all these flows consequently. Uh, the next thing is AWS startup credits. Um, so basically at a very early stage of the startup, you may not have the funding uh, and you may struggle to either maintain the costs of the servers that you're using in AWS. And AWS startup credits is very useful for that and it's not much, it's like a thousand dollars, but um, when you're managing a startup, sometimes thousand dollars can be much more valuable than a million dollar investment at that time. So AWS startup credits can help you with figuring out what to do with your AWS at a very early stage. Uh, and the next thing is to use train models through an API. Uh, you may have this brilliant idea how to use this uh, AI models in your software, but you may not have the resources yet uh, to develop them. So. Big cloud providers uh, offer their train models through an API at a very good price. So you pay per usage of the API. For example, for thousands of API calls, you can be charged a couple of cents. Obviously, it depends on the model that you're using. But these models reduce the, your time to enter the market because you can use this as a short-term uh, solution. Um, and then you can develop uh, your own a API, uh, your own AI pipeline after that. Um, so it's a good thing. You cannot, obviously, you can't use API forever, uh, but you can use it at a very early stage uh, until you develop your own. And last but not least, uh, funding. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about Georgia here, but because I'm not very competent at what's going on in international markets. So if you are a Georgian startup and if you lack funding, there are a lot of opportunities. For example, Jita, which basically owns this place, has a lot of grants and helped a lot of startups in Georgia uh, to achieve their dreams. And then there's Haik here, who is the co-founder of Axel, which is basically an um, angel investors network that will also um, help you with the funding and there's startup grant Tbilisi and there's many more. So uh, I, I would say that Georgia is a very good place for like a startup ecosystems uh, because we have um, a lot of potential in terms of fundings and we all want Georgia to be successful in the technological market. So um, we're doing everything we can to achieve that. Uh, and as a summary, what can we do in order to succeed in AI projects and startups is that we have to recognize the problem, we have to isolate the problem and understand it in very specific details, much like what Pulsar AI did, much like what Faber did, what V7 did, and what basically every successful startup did. We have to use the problem-first approach as we already discussed here. So we have to define the problem first, we have to then get the data, then train the model, and then we will get even more ideas and profit generated uh, from using this methodology. Uh, we have to engage our team in the decision process because they feel more happy, they feel more valuable to the team, and it's important that uh, every employee's voice is heard in the decision making process. Uh, we have to make sure that we actually have to use machine learning or AI systems to solve the problem because sometimes it's not needed, sometimes even a basic automation can help us do the job. So it's not necessary to spend all that resources, money and efforts in order to develop AI solutions. We have to prioritize AI projects based on their impact and based on their volume. Uh, and again, don't forget to value your employees and clients because um, aside from all the fundings, investments, uh, technical details, basically what makes the company successful is its employees and clients. Um, and last but not least, don't be afraid to experiment uh, because without experiments, especially in the startup ecosystem, it's very hard because you, you can't really apply something fixed to your own company because it simply won't work. Um, and I would go back to funding again, uh, and I would say don't be afraid to show off your product even at its earliest stages, because if you're not proud enough to do that, then nobody ever will. So 
Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And this also deserves, I think, one more round of applause because this was your first <laughs> public speaking. And I think it was excellent for the first one, so well done. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, of course, open the floor for the questions. If we, well, we uh, see a couple of hands here. And also for those who are watching us on Zoom, hello, uh, you can send a message in the chat or you most probably have access to our Slack account as well. So you can send your messages there. Let's start here. Sandro, please. I have a quick question. So why is V7 called V7? Oh, because like, we have like V1, V2 up until V6, which is like the, you know, like brain cells. I'm not sure what it's called. It's basically responsible for seeing. And V7 is something like an additional thing that they came up with. So that's why. Next level of brains, please. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Annie, uh, for the presentation. So, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> I'll go back to the beginning of your presentation when you talked about why people are afraid of uh, AI, especially uh, in the mainstream movies. Uh, mm -hmm. This idea is being promoted. Um, but again, um, maybe AI is not going to kill us, but maybe it is killing us softly <laughs> um, uh, while they are taking um, people's jobs, let's say. I think it's a very uh, wide spread idea as well. Uh, the example you mentioned, um, for example, now the chat box, the, uh, I don't know how you called it again? Uh, yeah, chat box. Chat box, they are replacing um, uh, humans, yes, the ones uh, who would, would be working at the call centers, for example. Uh, I'm just interested, since you are in the center of this um, industry, what are your insights on uh, AI, vice uh, unemployment? Thank you. Um, so basically what I would say here is that when you mentioned like social media chatbots, for example, they don't actually take anyone's job because if it was not an AI, it would probably be something from someone from social media team to answer that, right? Uh, so for example, social media manager answers the uh, questions that the customers have, uh, but now the chatbot does it. Uh, so then the social media manager actually does more important things, for example, post on social media, either promote, come up with posts, anything like that. So basically what AI does is not to like steal our jobs, but it makes it easier uh, because when you have this, for example, in the sales team for, uh, with, with Pulsar AI, uh, the conversational AI deals with customers and then sales team is responsible for upselling them. So they have more time and more resources to actually work on that, which is more valuable rather than like calling and actually answering um, emails or messages that, or questions that the customers have. So what they do is that they help us in everyday activities, like the manual labor that we perform and give us some time to work on things that we like or we think is more valuable rather than doing that. So I would say that it's not a threat. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you have more questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, can you stand up, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, um, I come from a sector very, very much different to this, uh, to business, but this out of curiosity, when the first time when I got introduced to machine learning and well, um, NLP and algorithms, one of the biggest questions that we do in academia is always precision and recall. So I wanted to ask you, inside AI teams, how do you deal with the side of the team that wants to do the project as accurate as possible and maybe the sales team that want to already start pushing it out at least to start getting the, the investment to eventually put into the market. So how do you deal between this, this technical side of perfecting the machine learning part and then to be able to put it into, into practice or into uh, the sales? If I understood the question correctly, so generally what we do is that when we have a product, an AI product, it's sometimes it's very difficult for the sales team to understand if they don't have, if they don't have a technical background to like identify the key features that they may use uh, in order to like talk to customers. So they don't know the functionalities that well. So what we do is that if we have someone in the sales team that's 
doesn't have a technical background or uh, at the first glance doesn't understand the functionalities, we have mandatory trainings for them. So they have around one or two week trainings that they go through and then they are introduced to what generally AI does, what are the basic machine learning algorithms and then they are uh, explained uh, what our product exactly does. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. How do we manage sales teams to cooperate with uh, technical teams? A little bit more on the decision making aspect of the thing. Do you put a milestone on, okay, we have certain precision so we can advance to the next stage on trying to get certain investors or we finally reach certain level, certain balance between precision and recall that we can put into the market. A little bit more on the strategy part on when is it that the machine learning is ready to be utilized for, for selling or for... Um, so it's basically hard to answer because I didn't have experience working with the startups that were at a very, very early stage. Uh, but what I can say is that um, for example, when we have to produce any new features of our AI systems, we always go to sales teams and they provide us with the feedbacks of the customers. So basically there are customers that they're saying oh, that it would be good to add this feature, for example, to your platform. And they come with the list of the features that customers asked for and then machine learning engineers prioritize those items by what's the, uh, I don't know, easiest item to actually develop, what's the hardest item. And then it goes to upper management and upper management also prioritize the item in terms of their values so and then we come to a clear decision and then the team uh, starts uh, working on that okay all right thank you for your questions do we have more questions from the audience maybe something happening in uh, slack or zoom all right so time for me to pick your brain um, you asked a question, there was a question from the audience about the you know machines and automation and AI taking our jobs and this has been the conversation since the first industrial revolution, you know, since the automation of, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, production uh, processes and, you know, when the, uh, uh, Henry Ford invented the conveyor. And of course, this conversation is happening right now at a different scale. But, but, but I have a, like ethical, like let's look at the sort of ethical side of the things, right? On one hand, yes, there is a social, social question Oh, like, you know, people becoming unemployed and yeah, okay, that's happening. I think if I'm not mistaken, 1% of the US population are drivers and like with the, you know, self-driving cars eventually replacing the cars, like, yeah, th these people will be unemployed, right? But, but on the other hand, and this is a question for you, isn't it good? Uh, they, they can do something else. <laughs> no, I would say that uh, as much as we think that AI is capable of stealing our jobs, it also creates like in other jobs as well. So it doesn't necessarily eliminate the number of spots for like employment. And also, uh, not all people again trust AI. So personally, uh, yes, I'm an AI man project manager, but I personally would not sit in a self-driving car until it was fully developed and tested. So I would simply go to an Uber, for example, at like this moment at this stage. And there are people who are, will never trust AI up until that point to sit uh, in a car with no driver, so. Like some people still don't trust television or radio or you know <laughs> some old technologies. This level of conservatism will most probably always exist. The question is how much time it will take you know, for the mass adoption. Yes. Uh, and then for feeling comfortable when you see a self-driving car uh, on the street, right? But why I asked this question, which was not really a question, but uh, why I wanted to uh, pick your brain, because like m my insight is, I absolutely agree with you, they are not really stealing the jobs, even if they are stealing the jobs, they are like stealing mundane, you know, repetitive, sort of boring jobs, which we'd better trust the robots, right? Which better we trust to the AI. Meanwhile, we as humans can, you know, continue our journey like on, on, on the next level, on the, yes. you know, V7 level, where we do something more, I don't know, inspiring, something more meaningful versus just, you know, dri driving a car, right? And, and again, when you look at what's happening in the factories or like an Amazon warehouse, right, you still see, you know, humans moving stuff, but a lot of things are being moved around by the robots. And I think that's beautiful, that, 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 that's great. So it's not like those people are now sitting at home and they are unemployed. 
I, I just guess they are doing something else. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that considering the fact that probably we only live once, we wouldn't want to like waste our time by like doing very, very boring manual things that can easily be automated or replaced by what AI does. So instead, we could use our free time to do something else, what we like, what we want to do, and stuff like that. So Become a photographer <laughs> or a data scientist. <laughs> what? Yes, obviously. <laughs> right, to get paid for doing something more awesome. Again, not, nothing against those mundane jobs. They are all needed. However, if they can be replaced, let's replace them, right? So, so um, you, you had a very uh, scary um, introduction, you know, with all of this Terminator and robots. <laughs> and this is like my most favorite topic. For those of you who have been attending that office for the past couple of years, I always have a panel or a discussion or a talk um, on this topic. I really want your insights because they're like different opinions. Uh, should we be, okay, let me frame it this way. Should we be afraid yeah. of, you know, these dogs that we saw <laughs> in, in, in the Black Mirror or no. actually literally last week they introduced some of those dogs who already have weapons on them mounted and there is a policy in the US so they're allowed to have like AI weapons basically. Like, the, again, the question is a bit not really a question, like should we be afraid or there's a sort of more rational yeah. uh, approach to the problem? Uh, so basically, obviously, there's going to be some type of advancements in AI uh, because this is not a developed field. But uh, if you ask someone who is working in AI or data science field, they will tell you how hard it is to actually get a very little, even a very little portion of intelligence into a machine, rather uh, let alone... Um, have, make it have the ability to like continuously self-improve and like um, do something like that because all the movies there that uh, we showed, uh, all of the characters there had that main feature in common that they had the ability to improve and self-adapt and at this point it's not possible for an AI to do that. Um, it's not possible, I agree. Uh, however, there is always this risk of uh, you know the bad uh, actor uh, and I don't mean a bad actor in a Hollywood movie, I mean a bad actor who can actually hack into the AI system and reprogram or recontrol or basically change the way it was intended to act. I'm not saying it will eventually become, you know, sentient being and make its own decisions, but what I'm saying is like it basically happened in the Black Mirror episode with the dog, right? It just decided to kill all humans. Like, how do you see the concern of the security in the context of AI? Uh, it's a matter of cybersecurity more rather than AI because it can be the same case in uh, like every software. Someone can hack into something, alter everything. Someone can like, I don't Except know. That's for my mobile bank cannot <laughs> kill me. I don't know, delete uh, very important data. I don't know, maybe credit history or something like that. So um, we, the, it's important to maintain all the cybersecurity protocols that there are. Um, and I think as long as they're maintained and at this point they're developed pretty nicely, as long as we maintain them, we don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Meanwhile, I'll be checking if there are like more questions, more hands. Do you want to add something? Yeah, please, uh, but, but stand up, yep. Yeah. Sorry, again. Um, first, I wanted to add something to that, and then I wanted to make you a question. But in terms of the security side of things, we also know that we may be developing chat box, but we are also developing anti uh, counter cybersecurity weapons at the same time. So it's not that it's going to be that easy to just hack into a dog and dog kill everybody. Um, but on the questions, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned the Pulse, Pulse AI and you mentioned the chat box, and I also was wondering, when most of the times when we are facing these chat box and we are speaking with them, most of the people have very different ways on how they're gonna frame a question or how they're gonna present data. And I, I, I was wondering if you were aware on how is it that they solve this problem of we don't all speak the same way, no, not only on language, but like on general. Um, uh, I, I didn't really have an experience with chatbots, but what I know that sometimes, I don't know if you had an experience with that, when you're talking to a chatbot through a messenger, for example, it gives you templates what you can ask and how to formulate a question. So you can use that. And if they don't have that, it's basically all about the data and training as well. They have to receive all types of data. They have to uh, consider the typos as well. They have to consider different letters, uppercase, lowercase. So it basically comes down to data and how they train it. So it can be achieved if you have necessary data. 
All right, thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Uh, let me ask uh, you. No, okay. L let let me ask um, something else. Again, you spoke about like different applications of AI, like different fields, also based on your experience. Um, name like three the most exciting fields, spheres where AI can be applied. Like, what's the next big thing? Um, well, the first thing I would say is healthcare because uh, one of our customers, what they do is that they are labeling eyes and they want to determine the eyesight um, state with an AI. So if you have a minus in your eye or if you have a plus, which basically comes down to the shape of your eye. So that's pretty nice. You don't have to like actually go to a doctor and read the letters, which is quite embarrassing because if you answer the letters incorrectly, you're quite ashamed. Um, so I would say healthcare has a very good potential to uh, automate any, uh, everything. Uh, again, there's going to be some trust problems with the people because they're not going to let uh, an AI model operate on someone, for example, but still um, at a very early stage, uh, at least with the detection uh, of the symptoms and problems, it can be very good. The second one, um, I would say it can be again chatbots because it's gonna eliminate a lot of manual labor with like having to sit at the computer and typing all those answers to the customers, which also can be quite annoying. And the third one is, I would say the transportation again, uh, because uh, the project that we were working on is um, basically there's there are cameras like in the road uh, and those cameras like film everything and then when there are accidents and the insurance com companies will benefit a lot from it is that the, when the camera films it, it detects whose fault exactly was it. It detects the motion and the position of a pedestrian or a car and it's easier to, uh, I don't know, say whose fault was it. So it's better than a biased uh, thought of an insurance manager, which you can't always trust. So. Right, very interesting overview. And I just also want to step a bit back. Uh, the participant asked, you know, about the credibility of the decisions that the AI might be making on um, humans' behalf. You know, there's this in, in, in interesting uh, philosophical question of, you know, the Vagonet problem, right? When uh, a human being, like, you, you know, the train is coming and they're like two people, you know, the, the train might crash them and then you as a human being have a chance, you know, to shift it so less people will be um, uh, damaged. And the problem doesn't have a solution per se, right? It's, it's an ethical, philosophical problem. And the question I want to frame is the discussion I want to have is, is the following. If human beings, if the humanity hasn't answered that question yet, like if there's no consensus on that, how smart it is, how possible it is to delegate that decision making to the AI in a self-driving car. And then if something happens, who is to blame, the AI or the humans who programmed it and trained the, the machine learning model there? Uh, I mean, it's wrong to, uh, go to an AI and ask for something that even humans don't have an answer to because AI is not a, like a powerful robot. It does everything that humans do, right? So it can do like things that humans can't do. It just does the same thing with like faster and uh, with less cost, for example. Uh, and with your question about like the self-driving cars, uh, I would say they would probably sue the company rather than like a programmer who did that because uh, it's the company's fault that they did something wrong and they didn't consider some aspects uh, in that regard, so. Oh, all right, I mean, I, I'm not arguing with that, but, but like when you say sue the company that eventually like boils down to the algorithm, right? And the algorithm is programmed the way that it has to do this or this and th this much probability is gonna do this. And like, like, like what I'm saying is the, the, the car is almost in an accident and it might hit someone and then it just cannot stop because it's going too fast, for example, right? But then it's programmed to do something else, but that something else also has a certain probability of causing another damage. So, so what I'm saying is like, wh who should be uh, programming? Like, do we have the ethical right to program the car to cause 
little damage. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question because why do accidents happen? Because there was a driver that was not paying attention. There was a driver that went on a red light and there was maybe a pedestrian that crossed the road on the red light. So it's not the car's fault that we have accident, it's the driver's fault. So if we program the car in a way that it follows all the guidelines, you can make sure that there's gonna be even less accidents because there's not gonna be a biased person who is in charge of driving the car. It's gonna be a machine which follows some certain rules. And those rules are often like uh, broken by people and drivers. And you will have the guarantee that there's not going to be a driver under influence or any sort of inconveniences like that. So, right. And my last question is, what are the ch this is again like very very hypothetical time horizon: ten years, fifty years, two hundred years. Any chance AI becomes centennial? I, I'm not saying becomes evil robot king, killing us, but like self-cautious. Uh, I mean, it can perform better activities, of course, because the industry will grow, obviously. Uh, but again, it will be very, very limited because it doesn't have the ability to actually copy what humans do. So it will never be on the humans level, let alone like go beyond them. them so this positive note that we have assurance that the robots are not going to kill us, basically. <laughs> uh, let's wrap up this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, it was amazing.